Thank you, Lord. Who's hungry for God? Amen. You're hungry for God, okay? Who's hungry? You, you, you always want. It, it's that like you're content, but you want more. Okay, you're hungry. You're hungry for God. You're hungry. And it, and it says like newborn babes crave the, the, the milk of God's word. We crave it and, and we want the meat of it, don't we? We want it. We want revelation in our life. And we don't want just information and feed ourselves fat and then not do anything with it. We want to walk this out. Okay, so it's, if we don't walk the word of God out, then, I mean, Jesus said, didn't he? he says, look, to those who have, more will be given. But to those who do not have, even what they have will be taken from them. That's an astounding statement. And there's, uh, there is a, we're going to walk this out, guys. We're going to walk this out together. And we're going to start with a few scriptures that can assure the type of life that is, is kind of available to us. You know, the Word of God says that God hides things for us, but not from us. Okay, so there's mysteries of the kingdom, there's places that we can walk in the Spirit, and, and God hides things for us, not from us. And, and who knows, like, you, you want to be in a place where you're maybe not yet. Okay? Now I know the Bible says things like that, we're risen up with Christ and we're sat with Christ in the heavenly places. Amen. But I, I know that I'm also living an earthly existence. It's not going to work on a Monday morning to call your boss and say, I can't come in today because I'm sat with Christ in the heavenly places. Okay, and, and, and so in the Bible we get these positional truths and then we get, we get these experiential realities. So we know that the old man is crucified, Romans 6, 4. Thing, but in Ephesians it says we ought to put off the old man. So the Bible tells us that the old nature has been positionally taken from us, and yet every day we ought to put it off. And so there's a there's a walk in this thing out. And when I read some of the things that the Lord Jesus said, he said things like this: whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I read statements like that from Mark 11:24, and does that whet your appetite? Or do we just read that and kind of skim it and pretend it's not real? Because he says, look, whatever things you ask, and if, if you really look at the Greek, it's saying, whatever you want. Whatever you want when you pray, believe you have it and it's yours. That's a big statement to make. John 14, 13 and 14 says, whatever you ask in my name. That I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask some things in my name, not anything in my name, I will do it. Amen. He says in John 15, If you abide in me and my words abide in me, if, if my words abide in you, you shall ask what you desire. In the King James it says, you shall ask what you will, what your will wants. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you're going to ask what you want, and it shall be done for you. And he goes on to say, and by this the Father is glorified. The Father wants this. This gives the Father glory. It makes him look good. Doesn't it? So he's saying, so when we're in a place where we abide in Him, in His Word, not just logical words, and I know, I'll say for, just for the record, Scripture is the written Word of God. There is no other written revelation on this planet other than what we have as the Holy Bible. It is the written Word of God. But we can search the scriptures, think we have eternal life and not come to Him. The Word has to become living on the inside of us. And when that Word becomes living on the inside of us, and it's part of our DNA, then we ask what we will and it's done for us. And by this, the Father's glorified. It makes Him look good. Who wants to make the Father look good? He wants to, in the eyes of our friends and family, they think, you've got a good God. Man, you've got a good God. Whew. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So who wants you to bear much fruit in your life? Yeah. The Father wants you to bear fruit in your life. He wants you to look good as well. Doesn't he? He, he, he? he gets to look good when you look good. When our life is shaping up. When we're walking in the blessing. What does good fruit look like? 
a life that's blessed, that's awesome. I'm talking this greed, greed, greed stuff, but we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater just because it gets abused, guys, okay? God wants us looking good in our life. Our life is wholesome. We're not just beaten down and like a punch bag for the devil. Okay, now God loves people. Please hear me if you're, if you're beaten down, oppressed, and that describes in some ways how you feel in life. Please don't take any condemnation, but you're not going to stay there. You're not staying there, okay? God is not glorified when His church is a punch bag for the devil. Look in a mess. All oppressed. He's glorified when we rise up into our position in Christ and know who we are. That makes Him look good. You know, if, you, if your kids... If you've got kids and your kids are doing well, does that make you look good as a parent? And do you want them to do well? You do, don't you? So God wants us to bear much fruit. And that word much in the Greek, it means a lot of fruit. Ridiculous. He wants you to look really good. Really good. Your life is blessed. And you're fruitful and... and you, other people's lives are being touched through you. People are getting saved and getting healed and getting set free. And say, this is so you will be my disciples. Now if you're somebody's disciple, you are like them. So Jesus, the Son, okay, when He prayed, did, did He get answered? Yeah. yeah, did He bear much fruit? Yes, yeah. Did He glorify the Father? Well, he, you know, his, he, he wasn't a punch bag for the devil, was he? No. He was the anointed of God. And he bore fruit everywhere he went. Okay, so he said, look, you're going to be a chip off the old block, okay? You're going to be like me. <coughs> That's why we need a new Jesus. The Bible talks about another Jesus, another spirit. The kind of mindset that we've got in the United Kingdom of who Jesus is, we need to get it shifted and changed. We need a revelation of the Jesus from Scripture. Okay? The Jesus from Scripture, the Christ of God. Okay. Now, so this is what Jesus wants us to come into. He really, the Father is, is this is the Father's desire for our life. Now, there's this kind of term, I think, in, um, I don't want to, I've mentioned before how psychology basically is, is, it's not based on the cross, okay? It's not. It's self, um, working on yourself, self-improvement and all that stuff. The church is full of self-improvement teaching. It's not the gospel. It's not. It's another gospel. But there is, a, there is an understanding in, in psychology, I think, where you have like an ideal self, and then you have the reality of who you are. Okay? And really, who you are and who you think you should be kind of don't match up. And it causes all kinds of internal conflict and stuff like that. And you can go to, and you get a lot of internal conflict and damage and stuff like that. But we'll leave, we'll leave that kind of thing there. But in some ways, we know we're not where we're at yet. But there's no condemnation, guys. And the only way we can get there is by beholding Him and being transformed from one degree of glory to another. If we're given a load of self-improvement techniques uh, and work and try and work on ourselves, we're going to end up disappointed. Or we're going to end up extremely proud and arrogant because we appear to have improved. And guess what? Whose effort was it done on? Ours. God doesn't get the glory then. So it's by beholding Him. Okay. Now look, we look at this kind of high, if you like this, high life in Christ. You think, why isn't it happening, really, in the church? And I'm not claiming, hey, it's happening here. We're seeing God do some great things. Amen. Give God the praise. In Ephesians 4.11, it says, and we mentioned this earlier, he gives some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. There needs to be a fivefold ministry in the church, okay? Yeah. Right. And it says for this, for the equipment of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith. That isn't so we all sat together, every church in Leeds sing and come by yard together. We believe in a basic unity with other churches who believe in the essential things of the faith, okay? So we, we can't be in unity with groups or churches who don't believe in biblical marriage. We're not. We're not in unity. We're not making a scornful judgment on them. We don't hate 
disagreements not hated. We don't hate anybody. We can't be in unity with people who don't hold to um, who, who the person of Jesus Christ is and his humanity and his divinity, the resurrection from the dead, the, 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 the trinity, all that sort of stuff. You, 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 know, you know where we're at. But there's a unity of the faith here and quite often people think a unity of the faith is let's find the lowest common denominator. So we all get together and sing Kumbaya. And, and this is a unity of the faith of Jesus Christ. New, like for instance, New Testament Christianity, baptism in the Holy Ghost is central to it. You can't get you can't get free of that. So we can have a basic unity with all believers, but if we're going to grow up into Christ, we have to just push beyond the normal, okay? And when you look at the New Testament's teaching on the church, most of it is in the context of local church. That's why it talks about pastors, elders, deacons, and all that sort of things, okay? So, and it's saying, we all come with unity of the faith, and this is it. The knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. The knowledge, that word knowledge, it's not book knowledge, it's the word epignosis. It means intimate, intuitive knowledge. So, if somebody is an IT expert and I come into their knowledge, it's like I become an IT expert. If someone's an, an artist, a craftsman, and, and if, it, if I can just come into their intuitive knowledge, because there's some things, it, it's not book learning, it becomes an intuitive thing, you become a craftsman, an artist, you become it. And so we, the Bible saying, God wants us to come into the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. That word perfect means a fully mature man. This is speaking about the church. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ. So if the full stature, I don't know, is like this. Okay, where's the church? Maybe the church in some parts of the world is say, here. And they're saying a lot of good things. I mean, I've got a friend who's been to Brazil lately, and some of the reports he sent are just astounding. But really, where's the church in the UK been? Probably somewhere like, you know, five, you know, a centimetre off the ground, basically. Stuck in traditions of men that make the word of God of no effect. So the church needs to grow up into the full stature of the perfect man of Christ. Okay? In elsewhere in that letter he prays and he says, I'm praying that you get strengthened with might by the Spirit in your inner man. Not according, you know, according to his riches and glory. That the Christ, and if you read it in the Greek and in like the Weiss translation, it says that the reality of the Christ may settle down and feel at home in your hearts through faith. Well, I already have Jesus in my life. It says that the reality of the Christ, of the anointed one, and his anointing in the kingdom will settle down in your heart through faith. You've been rooted and grounded in love. Will comprehend the love of God, the height, width, and depth of it, and be filled with the fullness of God. So there's a growing up into the full stature, and there's a there's a reality of the Christ filling the church with the fullness of God. That's revival. That's revival, and that's happening in parts of the world today. You know, and then we, we looked at this a bit earlier in the, in the year, right? There's, um, in the New Testament Greek, there's basically four different words, and I'll be very quick here, for the word son. Now, we're all of us, whether we're male or female, we're all sons of God. Okay, there's neither male nor female in Christ. So there's no place for, for, for you know, misogyny, sexism, attitudes in the church of Jesus Christ. There's neither male nor female. So just say hello to your neighbor and say, you are a son. You're a son. You're a son. You're a son. And us guys, we all get to be the bride. So we're the bride. Amen. Now what the Bible's saying in like Ephesians 1, it says that you have been put into the place of the Son. That's where you've been put. But we're growing up into it. Now in Greek, there's, uh, there's four different types of words for Son. The first one is a nepio, which is like a baby. A baby. Okay, we know what that is. The next one is a, is a, a padion, which is like a toddler. That's someone who can do some things, but they're immature. They're emotionally unstable. And they still often need cleaning up. They make mess. Anyone got any children around that age? And you know what it's like, isn't it? You're just about to sit down and relax. 
and you're now faced with a 15 minute clean up job ok, at the wrong time of night and it makes you grow in grace, amen right, the next age of a son is a technon a technon, right sounds like techno, techno, technon and that is an adolescent that's someone who's becoming mature and is beginning to be used by God. Someone who's maybe moving in the gifts of the Spirit, moving powerfully in the gifts of the Spirit even. But someone who can still have character issues, still can have rebellion issues, authority issues, maturity stuff. And you know what? There's so, there's so many people... Uh, particularly in parachurch ministry, who are not rooted in local churches because they've got some gifting on their life and social media is used to promote them. There's a lot of technons. Okay, and fly into town, put on a few days, looks great, and fly out of town. But they don't carry that strength and stability. So you've got to have to sermon in there. So there's a technon. The next one is, is a, a huoi, which is a mature believer. This is someone whose mind and emotions are healed. Their will is yielded, obedient, broken and submissive. He or she is ready to walk in their inheritance and to be sent into their calling. Amen. And that's a quite, there's a lot to take in here. But can you get this, yeah? Okay, where to grow up into sonship and there's a lot of people are frustrated I think a lot of people become adolescents and say like they're 17 years old and they just get the keys to the car and they just stay there but there's more, there's more and where they grow up into the full stature of Christ but you know what the way up in the kingdom it's the way down isn't it who said that, the way up is the way down in the kingdom of God. Uh, and last week, we were looking at how Jesus, he went through tests in the wilderness, didn't he? We were looking at some of the tests he went through. He got, he got filled with the Spirit. There you go again, filled with the Spirit. Oh, I really felt the presence of God. And I've had great prophetic words over my life about what I'm going to do. And sometimes it can feel like I've been told I'm going to have a part on a great movie. And I'm just waiting for Steven Spielberg to ring me up on Monday morning. To say, hey, we're calling you in. You got the A-list job. You're there, man. We heard you had that word on Friday night. Come on in. And it ain't like that. At all. Maybe years. Years. Wilderness. Obscurity. Testings. Character stuff. That's the way into our inheritance. This is the way into when Jesus said, if you ask anything you want, in my name. This is the way into that life. And Jesus had to be tested. And he didn't have any character flaws. He didn't have any sin. But he still had to be tested. And he had to be tested on his sonship and on his identity of being the beloved. Okay? And the last test we were looking at, the last test he had, there was turn the stones to bread. If you worship me, all these kingdoms will become yours. They were already going to become his anyway. And they are going to become his. Okay, but the last test is when, he, when the enemy put him on the pinnacle of the temple. And we read that and we don't realise the drama of it. And, and how would you like to be just right now, supernaturally, any volunteers here, if you could be supernaturally taken out of your seat now and stood on the spire of Leeds Town Hall right now. I mean when you look at it you can see all the Parkinson building, you know that big white building, somewhere like that. Let's say, say put on the spire on top of the clock tower of Leeds Town Hall and you're going to stand on something probably about the area of this stand here, okay? You, you're going to be like that. Any volunteers right now for that? I mean, when you look at it from a distance, you think, oh, that's all right. But if you were stood up there just now, supernaturally, you were stood on that, you'd be like, whoa. And every slight wind, you think you're going to fall. And so Jesus, this, this is such an extreme test, right? He was put in a moment of extremity. A moment of extremity. And, and um, obviously... Facing real fear. Who knows that Jesus was a man? 
fully God but fully man. So we experience everything we experience. And so really for us to come in our calling in God, for us to come in the inheritance and walk the Christ life, there's going to be times, there might be a time when you're going to be put in a moment of extremity. And I just felt the Holy Spirit say, we need to come back to this. This for Jesus was facing the prospect of death. And you think, okay, well, people flippantly say it all the time, I'm not afraid to die. But they've never died. So, hello? What, what, it, you know, if people know they're in their last five seconds, everything in them wants to live. Wants to live. And he's facing, and it's not just death. You see, it's, the, it's facing the very real prospect that all of his potential, all of his destiny, is game over. Okay, and some of us are maybe in that moment now, or you'll come into a time in the future where you feel as if the enemy's put you in a place and it's game over time. And you've been following God and you've been faithful. You've had some slips and trips, but you've picked yourself back up. You've followed Jesus. But here you are in a moment of extremity. Maybe you're facing the prospect of death. <coughs> Maybe it's a health thing. Maybe you're waiting to hear something from a doctor. Maybe it's that business you've worked hard for and it's just all. It's just all gone. And everything you are, and everything that validates you as a child of God, and your calling, your potential, your destiny, is now completely on the line. And it's potentially looking like game over time. You're getting terminated. And for some people, you sat in church, you remember a past... And I'm not, you know, if you're working in these places, you, you know, you've worked the agency job. Shelf stacking, burgers, done that sort of thing. I once did a job uh, where I sanded furniture all day. Next, next, next. That was my job. Okay, maybe you've come from something like that. And, and, and you've followed Jesus and you've been faithful in giving, in sowing, in integrity and here you are and it looks like everything that validates who you are is about to get terminated right now or very soon okay and it's a real place of threat and it's as if like you know in life you either, you're either going to follow the chickens and be a chicken with your head face in the ground, eating off the ground, and that's about it. Or you're going to become an eagle and get off the ground and get up there in the sky. Okay, so here you are, you're an eagle. You think, I guess I ain't. I guess I'm just a chicken. And this is the test, you see, because you see, the devil does not have the power to abort you. Okay, you know you're called to be an eagle, you're called to fly, you're called to follow Jesus Christ. But right now there's a temptation just to throw in the towel and suck it. Oh, I was a chicken all along and go back to the chickens. And you can't do it. You can't do it. And everything in you, you you're, you're, you're frightened, you've got real fear. Have you ever had fear where you feel like you're going to vomit and be sick? Yeah. With fear. With fear. Can you feel it? Potential game over. Shame and disgrace. Maybe people who even love you, who think well of you. But they're going to look at your life. And you know by the look in their eye, and you're going to feel the shame. You know, well, go on that course of action you took. And you did it in the best intentions of following Jesus. You weren't perfect. But now, you're going to kind of have to they were right. Go back to the chickens. And this is the moment when it's on the line. And you see, Jesus went into the wilderness full of the Spirit, but he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. If we want the power of the Spirit, you've got to go through this test. 
And you know what? The, the core issue of this test for you, for me, is dying to self love. It's dying to self. It's dying to fear. It's dying to everything. We read that verse of scripture and you, you get it quoted and they always chop off the end of it. We overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Full stop. No, it's not a full stop. It is the most important bit probably. are not loving our life to the death. Comes a point where as a believer, if we're going to walk in fullness and in freedom and real security, we've got to take everything that we feel gives us security and let it go. Even the fear of our own demise or someone we love, their demise, everything, everything. And trust Him. Trust Him. I remember a couple of years ago when I started going to Africa ministering there. And I've got a really, I, I've got a young family now, four children and a, a wife I dearly loved. And they were younger then. And so I'm, I'm planning life insurance policies, just in case. And I'm not saying it's wrong, please don't anyone leave here today and cancel that. No, you have to hear God yourself, don't think, well that's the pastor, he's done that. And No, but this was my way and I felt God say, look, are you going to trust me? I was getting anxiety and fear about it. I was due to leave in a few weeks time. I would have sleepless nights. I would wake up. I mean I wasn't kind of going to Somalia or somewhere like that. But it still got risks. And I just remember one day having a, a, a real time with God. And, he, and Psalm 91 has always been special to our life. And he says, is that not enough for your life insurance? So ah, it is. So he says, well, get on to the insurance company and email them back and tell them you've got another policy. Yeah. I felt this burst. God say that. I said, right then, I will. So I, I copied and pasted Psalm 91 into the email <laughs> to the insurance people. And I stood there shaking. And I said, dear, whatever his name was, I forgot. Thank you for all your service. I'm really sorry if I've wasted any time. I found another insurance policy. And I heartily recommend it to you. And when I press send, Boom, all the weight came off. Free as a bird. Amen. Hallelujah. All the days ordained for me written in his book before any of them come into being. No devil, no man can take a second off my life before God says so. And you just, I had to let it go. And I went with no fear and I still go with no fear. As long as you're obedient to God. Because I thought, you know, I could stay here in the UK, be disobedient to God and get, get end it on the M1. And the, that's just an example. There's loads of ways we've got to let go. And we need to understand, you know, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says this, Inasmuch then that the children have partaken of flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had had, doesn't have it now, the power of death that is the devil and release those who, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Everyone says, I'm not afraid of dying. And they say flippantly, do you know, dying is not just when our body dies. Dying is the extinction of your dream. Death, in all of its forms that it can come to us, is the extinction and the aborting of your purposes and everything God's called you to be. And, and something in every human being, you could, you know, some of the world's greatest dictators, men and women, men mostly, who've done some of the most wicked, hideous things, you know, back in history, and you think, Adolf Hitler, people like that. A lot of them were just driven by a desire, I've got to be significant, I've got to be a somebody, I've got to make a difference in the world. But then this fear that drives people, and I think what someone said, some people, people who hurt a lot of other people, are often just doing it, they, feel, they want to feel a bit better about themselves basically. And there's this thing, this really every human being has inside, we know we are impotent. Even the most impressive people on this planet, the most impressive athletes, the most impressive business people, inside impotent. And you know what? Every human being, it, the Bible says, is subject to bondage. 
doesn't just mean that you're in bondage, and it means bondage means being a slave, living in chains. You're not just living in chains, you're subject to living in chains. That means you are under the authority of living bound up. Why? Because you're afraid of dying. Not just afraid of dying, dying, when you get to 70 or 80, you've got this fear of letting go of self. That's where it comes from. It's all the self-preservation. Self-preservation. It's the very thing when we trust Jesus Christ that He has took it. So if you end up in a situation where it looks like game over, aborting, you can have all the peace of God in your heart. And I'm not going to jump off and think, I'll oh, just get back down with them chickens, I'm a nobody. I'm just going to stand. I'm just going to stand and I'm going to lift my hands and praise them. And I thank you God that the devil does not have the power to kill my life. He doesn't have the power to kill me, kill my potential, kill my dreams, bring his death into my life, kill who I am, send me back to them chickens. Right now I, I, don't, I haven't a clue what's going on. I am just going to lift my hands with heart abandoned, you know as the song goes, and praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the devil is going to freak out, man. I tell you, he's just, he can't understand it. He has been destroyed. The Bible says he's been destroyed. The English God, the English Jesus, that's kind of like him and the devil are equal opposites. What we've been fed is we've got a big devil and a little God. Like we said, whenever you see a movie and a Christian goes up against the powers of darkness, you know, the little vicar guy goes in the haunted house, you know who's going to get their butt kicked, don't you? It's going to be the Christian. It's not like that. The devil has been defeated. He's been defeated. And look, this fear of losing your potential, your dream, your vision, who you are, the very validity of who you are, the devil cannot do it. But somehow you've got to have your eyes on Jesus, fix them on Jesus and step out of the fear of it. Step out of the fear of it. Who cares if you're in a situation you're slandered? Who cares if you lose everything in a way? If you cannot care. There's a right way of living where you just don't care. Have no care. Be free. How much more are you worth than many sparrows, than the, the flowers of the field? Be free. <sighs> Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Cling to Him. Look to Him. Hallelujah. And now get into this place. And do you know what it is? At the core of it is our ego. Most of the time when we get hurt by people, what's the problem? Our ego doesn't like it. There's a problem, isn't it? Ego, self-preservation, self-protection, my future. And I'm not saying we shouldn't plan and stuff like that. We've got to, you know, be wise. And but it's the, it's the difference. It's about ego. And when these things... And there's been this dying of self. And I don't mean a religious dying of self that's taught where, you know, self-flagellation. This is what brings a man and a woman into the power of the Spirit. This is what, this is what, when Paul said, I am crucified to this world and the world is crucified to me. I live in the world, but I'm not of it. I'm free. I know how to abound, I know how to be abased. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, He said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross occasionally. So take up his cross daily and follow me. Now Jesus said in Matthew 28, He said, Everything, everything, everything I've taught you, go make disciples and teach them to choose what they want to Look at about me. No, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So is this for us today? 
It's for us today because it came out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. He didn't say, by the way, or by the way, um, after the cross this doesn't apply to you because this is an age of hyper grace now. And you just live in a permanent place of, 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 of this kind of rest. Where you, you never have to fight, you never have to ca- carry a cross, that's legalism. No, Jesus never said anything like that. He said things like this in John 12, 24. He said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life whoo, will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. There I am, my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honour. This is the way for the walk and the honour of God. And this isn't a religious flagellation thing. Okay? Now, some people, right, they can take these verses on self-denial, and I've seen it. Self-denial is biblical. It's not self-punishment. It's the ego. The ego. The me, myself and I needs putting on the cross. How often? Every day. Every day. You know, my ego, guys, stinks. Awful. Horrible. Got a horrible ego. Now, I'm not coming to that church again. The guy, the pastor, he's, got, he's full of ego. What awful of ego. Your ego's horrible. Your me, myself, and I, it's awful. It's awful. It stinks. Selfish. <coughs> Some people's ego looks better than other people's ego, though. Some people's ego is just nasty, horrible. Other people's ego looks really kind and serving. You know, some people have a Mother Teresa complex. It's their ego. It's all for self. It's all self. Everything is self never bears fruit at all. Self never bears fruit. But you know, I would never, and you can can take these type of verses and this understanding and have a false impression that God wants you to live poor. God wants you to live beaten down. God doesn't want you to have anything. All that's lies. You know, I believe in biblical prosperity. I don't believe in the biblical prosperity that exalts ego and pride. You know, when we look at the truth, we say, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, was not poor. Wasn't. He lived by faith as an itinerant minister for three years. It was his free choice. He could have went, no, I think I want to get married. I'm 30 years old, now it's about time. I've got a nice little carpentry business here. I'll start a bit of ministry on the side. Jesus of Nazareth Ministries, get a Bible college going, would have been pretty good. Now he chose to be an itinerant minister, living by faith. And you know what? God brought some gr- pretty wealthy people to sow into his ministry. Like some woman who was the wife of Herod's chief servant, steward. Right? His best mate, Lazarus, was a millionaire. Lazarus' sister poured a bottle of perfume on Jesus that was worth a year's wages. That was from Lazarus' house. Average wage in the UK is 26 grand a year. What kind of people have 26,000 pound bottles of perfumes around the house? Answers on a postcard. <laughs> Jesus' best friend. He didn't live in a little tiny little place, he would have had a big estate. He just happened to have, but he probably had more than one. Tw- a couple of, uh, a cabinet full of perfumes that all cost 26 grand. Has anyone ever heard of perfume that cost 26 grand? I'm sure it's out there. So, Jesus wasn't poor. He wasn't poor. And he said things, you know, it says in scripture, he he, he became poor that we through his poverty might be enriched. And the scripture is clear that God has redeemed us from the curse of the law. That, and part of the curse of the law is this grinding poverty so that we can be blessed. So tell your neighbour, God wants you blessed. God wants you blessed. God wants you in a place where anything you ask in the name of Jesus, that will, you, that will He do. God wants you in that place where anything you ask, whatever you desire when you pray, you believe and you have it. Is that what you want? I want that. Is that so you can, we can spend it on our selfish fleshly desires? No, 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 no. But what a beautiful place to be. 
Jesus said, do not fear little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He wants us to have the kingdom. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit, those who, the crux of it, the ego, is dealt with. Poverty of spirit. Not this kind of, you know, holding a little wooden ball out all of a twist out. That's not poor in spirit, right? Ego is surrendered. You can have the kingdom. You can have the kingdom. You can't have the kingdom of God when self is on the throne. The two don't fit. The, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Look, Lord, who is the greatest in the kingdom? You know, how do you get significance, Lord? We want to be significant. We want to be somebody. We want to have our potential. I want to reach into my calling and my destiny and be somebody. And let's not lie inside each one of us. We don't want to be a chicken. Who wants to be somebody? Come on, be honest and put your hand up. I, you know, don't feel selfish. You, you want to be somebody. You, don't, you want to make a difference. You want to wake up in the morning knowing you've got identity and purpose and potential. It's normal. It's alright when, when God is dealing with it. We're made in the image of God. God is a somebody. God is a success at everything He does. He's never failed yet. So he said, look, they're saying, look, who's the greatest, Lord? And Jesus called a little child, and he said, unless you're converted, unless you change and become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom. Never. You know, there's a lot of people who have a basic salvation, who are going to heaven, who've never in this life really entered the kingdom. The king's dominion. The live carnal. Live in the flesh. Live wrapped up in self. Me, myself and I. They've got a basic salvation. But that salvation hasn't worked itself fully out in them. Kingdom means king's dominion. Nicodemus came to Jesus. We know you're from God because of the miracles. Jesus answered him. Answered that issue. Unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't enter the realm of living where anything you ask God will do. You can't enter that place of freedom. You can't enter that place where you're no longer subject to bondage. What stands between us and living in that freedom that we read about from the lips of Jesus? It is living subject to bondage. That's it. That's it. And you know, I can read this week after week, and we can leave church and spend the rest of this week realising, I'm not living this. I'm not experiencing this. But I put my hands up, I'm, I'm saying some things, but I want more, I want more, I want more. And yet, we could take a, a point of view, well, let's just do lots of social projects. Let's forget we have a supernatural God. And I'm not saying we shouldn't help the poor and do those things, but Buddha and his friends can do it too. The, Atheists can do it as well, better than we can. How can we live a life, live the Christ life? Anything you ask in my name, that will I do. Anything you want when you pray, that will the Father do. That the Father is glorified. I can't, I can't walk away from that. I feel half the church walks away from that, skirts around it, pretends it's not there. Somehow it was for people in the first century, no it's for now. It's for when the church grows up into the full stature of Christ. But in that, growing up, going up is going down. And it's dealing with the me, myself and I that is rooted in the fear of death. The fear that comes from death. The fear that tells you you're going to fail. You're not going to provide a future for your kids and leave an inheritance. That, that venture you're going for, you may as well give in and just go back to what you were. You are a nothing. That's the fear of death. And you know, it's all rooted in ego. It's all rooted in fear. And when we leave it behind and step out and fix our eyes on Jesus and go, Do you know what? I don't give a stuff anymore. I'm only going to listen to His Word. Hallelujah. Do you know, all ego is, is desiring to be something in a way. And all that has to die. 
Because Jesus said to the guys, look, you want to be the greatest, you want to be a somebody, you've got to become like this little child. And it's not like we have to become immature, become babyish. No. It means that we come to a place where we're prepared to admit we know nothing. Amen. Nothing. Nada. Nout. Or if you're from Leeds, no. Is this a no? No. No. I know no. I know no. And I've got to learn all over again. And in a sense, every day carrying our cross is coming before God. Like, I know no. No. I'm totally dependent. I'm totally dependent. And I'm stripped bare in a sense. Even the things of the world, and you can have a great pension plan and insurance policies and all this stuff and great salaries. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Please don't go away and think that you've got to get into self austerity. No, that's that's actually a form of religion, okay? And the devil can use that. But in a way, in our heart, we have to let go of everything. Everything, everything that threatens who you are, let go of the fear of it. What you think of yourself, other people think of yourself. And all of that being something, in a sense, has to die. And you look at everyone in scripture, that's the way. And somehow I wish it wasn't. And Paul said, those who, have, those who are Christ's, <coughs> have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires, the drives, the ego. Those who are Christ's, those who are mature in Christ, have crucified the flesh. You know, people talk about, there's a lot of talk about sonship, we're sons of God, and we talk about it here. And we live in that place of victory. In Romans 8 it says this, 13, it says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. It just means you're going to experience death in your life. You're going to be subject to bondage and fear. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, put to death the flesh, you will live for as many as are led by the Spirit or the sons of God. So how is the Spirit going to lead us? The Spirit, the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life is to pour the love of God in our heart to displace fear and enable us to crucify our dirty ego. Amen. Dirty ego. I don't say let's punish ourselves, flagellation, it was all done on the cross. We're just positionally enforcing it in our own life. Whatever extremity we're facing, and it could mean the th a real threat in every situation. God, I just need this. First of all, I need to surrender in this situation. We can even be claiming the promises of God. You know, we're just driven by fear, insecurity, all those things. It's all a form of self. Self. Self is, it's the seed that came from the enemy. Praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, if we want to live in victory, the way up is the way down. You see, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. The Spirit is going to lead us to crucify our ego with its drives, its selfish egoism, its rebellion, its fear, its doubt and unbelief. And this isn't some kind of medieval teaching on let's climb the stairs with broken glass. Because you know what? Do you know who your, our, our own worst enemy is? Not the devil. It's the person you look at in the mirror every day. Who wants to be free of themselves? I want to be free of me. I want to be free. This is freedom. This is coming into freedom from the core fear of death. You see, everything, and this is, this is uh, not easy to say right, everything of our human potential has to die for us to succumb into the call of God. And if God has a call on your life 
to become this, whatever it is, then everything naturally about you that will get you there has to die. Because when you get there, if it hasn't died, then you've done it yourself. But if all that stuff's dead, and it's going to die, and it's, it's not nice, when you do get there, and it's a, goodness me, it's a miracle, you know who give you that foundation. Who give you that platform in business, in ministry, in your family being blessed? Who give you it? Jesus. And does he need our flesh and our natural abilities? No, thank you. Now we've got to be wise and make decisions, yes. But it's in him. It's in him. You, you, you know, we looked at before. God wants us blessed. Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. That the blessing of Abraham, Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Who wants the blessing of Abraham? Abraham. Yes. Expansion, multiplication, a blessed life. But for Abraham, he got this call of God on his life, I'm going to bring this great nation through you. And the prospects for it happening, did those prospects improve or did they get worse? They got worse. Joseph, did his prospects improve over time or did they get worse? They got worse. They got worse. And it didn't look good. And, and what was his reputation feeling like when he's in the dungeon? You're about to become Prime Minister. It says of Abraham, we'll come closing soon. Keep stepping forward into that um, feedback, sorry. In Romans 4, 19 it says, And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. So everything about his natural potential, not there. No. It's no. It's just no. And somehow, he managed to keep his no. He managed to keep his eye on the, on the Lord, on the goal. And he wasn't weakened. He didn't waver. He didn't get double-minded. He was strengthened in faith by how? By giving glory to God. By praising God. He could have been having his pinnacle moment. The enemy gets him in that place. Hey Abraham. Well the missus, she's getting on a bit, isn't she? And you ain't looking too good either, mate. <laughs> Where's this nation coming from? Abraham. I don't think you're Abraham. Father of a multitude. I think you is just Abraham. You're not even that. You're not even a father. You're a nobody. And it ain't going to happen. And he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Giving glory to God. Simply praising God. And this is why it costs. This is why praise and worship costs. We're coming into land. It says in Hebrews 13, 15, it says, Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. Jesus said, Every day, carry your cross. Every day die to self. Elsewhere the New Testament says, by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body. By the Spirit we put off the flesh. Continually offer a sacrifice of praise. I think that's the gateway into the Spirit of God of putting off the flesh. Because the Spirit is always going to lead us to put off the flesh. Continually carry a cross, continually offer a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lips given thanks to his name. <sighs> Hallelujah. I heard a quote, and I mentioned this at the start of this year, just as we really are closing. And when I heard this ten years ago, it, it, I reacted at it. But I came to say it's true. The man of God, and he felt the Holy Spirit say it to him, Son, if you will worship me, I'll give you anything you want. If you will worship me, I'll give you anything. Yeah, well, that's not true worship, is it? I'm just worshipping God to get something. No, I'm worshipping God irregardless. 
Exactly. Because when we're in the place, when we learn to truly praise and worship God, the ego is displaced. The very thing that stops us having the promises of God in our life is self. And you know, you know when you've come into the presence of God, it's like you've let go inside. In the Psalms it says, my soul is like a weaned child within me. It's at peace. But quite often so your emotions, your mind, is like a spoilt little brat. In it, or is it just mine? And when that spoilt little brat just kind of dies, sits down <coughs> and shuts up, and then you're in worship, the presence of God starts to fall on your life. You see, it was in the presence of whom he believed that Abraham received the promise. It's in the presence we get the promise. It's in the presence that the promises are fulfilled. It's in the presence that we bring our sacrifice. In view of God's mercies, present your mind, your faculties, your body as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual and reasonable act of worship. You know that God accepts your sacrifice <coughs> when there's fire on your life. When you live in presence and live in fire and you start entering into the power of the Spirit, you know that's when the ego, the me, myself and I, your worst enemy, my worst enemy is on that altar. Sacrifice. That's praise and worship. That's praise and worship. That's praise and worship. And that's the place where God will just give us anything we want. Because the ego ain't there anymore. Anything you want when you pray, that will I do. That the Father's glorified. He looks really good. Hallelujah. Because now, he says, look, there is a son of mine. There is a son of God. Those who by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, as many as are led by the Spirit, they're the sons of God.